Good morning and welcome to our worship service this morning. Uh, we welcome you to our worship service on this Valentine's Day 2021. It is our sincere desire that our Lord blesses you through our worship this morning and we encourage and invite you to not only join us in the future but have your friends and relatives join us. You can see our worship services on Facebook, on YouTube and on our website and we pray God's blessing upon you as you worship with us this morning. I just have a couple of announcements. Speaking of virtual worship, our sessions just met this past week and decided that we will not be worshiping in person until April at the earliest. And so uh, through the month of March, we'll continue these virtual worship services. And then the session will meet in uh, March to decide what to do in April. Second, though, we were going to have a Ash Wednesday service. We'll be recording that and posting it by February 17th. And we ask you to invite somebody to view it with you. There will be communion. So please uh, look on our website or look on your emails. Uh, we will have the notifications as to our uh, Ash Wednesday worship service. Let us just call to worship. Let us come to our Lord in worship this morning. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the distant shores be glad. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. All the people see his glory. For you, O Lord, are most high over all the earth. You are exalted above all gods. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones, and praise his holy name. We will now sing a few praise songs to his glory.
confession. The writer of Hebrews says, We have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us come and confess our sins before our forgiving God. Just take a moment, private confession of sins. Precious holy God, we know that we're not a holy people. We have not sought you in all our lives, and we have not cared for one another. We have harbored hurtful thoughts and said harmful words. We have not said or done things that would relieve pain, and we have not reached out to those who are different from us in looks or in thoughts. We build walls to separate instead of bridges to join. Forgive us for our self-centered ways. Give us hearts of care to care and hands to reach the needs of those around us. Empower us, Lord, to love those others as you love us. This we ask in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Sister? My friends, who is there to condemn us? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in heaven to intercede for us. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Prayer of illumination. Lord God, our, open our hearts and our minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Amen. The scripture I'm going to read is Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 through 31. For if we willful, willfully persist in sin after having received the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful prospect of judgment and a fury of fire will consume the adversaries. Anyone who has violated the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony or of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by those who spurn the Son of God, profane the blood of the covenant by which they were sanctified, and outrage the Spirit of grace? For we know the one who said, Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, beloved. Last week, we looked at the uh, marks of perseverance, how to be steadfast in the face of difficulties. Uh, and we're certainly facing difficulties in this day and age. The writer of Hebrews exhorts us to do five things. He says, draw near to God, hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, Consider how to spur one another on to love and good deeds. Do not give up meeting together and encourage one another to remain faithful until Christ comes. Now the very next verse is what we heard read this morning and it sounds as if the writer has taken a whole new subject, but that's not the case. What he's addressing is the major obstacle to our perseverance. Interestingly, it's not the opportunities of difficulty that we face. It's not the struggles that we face in keeping and meeting those, but rather the obstacle is ourselves. And that's because that obstacle that keeps us from persevering in our faith is within us. He's quite clear the obstacle that will prevent us from persevering in faith is sin in our lives. That's as blunt as it can be said. It's sin that keeps us from persevering. 
Now, this is not a popular subject, I know. Um, it's shunned by our polite society. We talk about weaknesses, we talk about um, challenges within culture, we talk about personality disorders, we talk about environmental struggles to explain our actions that hurt ourselves and hurt others, that alienate us from each other and from God. But the truth is that what is behind that is our sin. Now, today is Valentine's Day, and so you would expect a sermon on love. Why in the world is she giving us a sermon on sin on Valentine's Day? Well, I suggest to you that God's love is the core of our addressing sin. A day of love, of warm emotions, but that's not what scripture suggests love is about. It suggests love is about actions. We hear in 1 John 4.10, this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. In Romans 5, 8, we hear, but God demonstrated his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. My friends, there's no greater expression of love than what Christ did for our sins, to make it possible for us to be forgiven. So we've sinned. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. The reason for Christ's death was to pay the penalty for our sins. And through Christ, our sins are forgiven. And we're made one with Christ and able to be united with one another. But that's not once for all. I wish it were. That's how we all come into faith in Christ, but it doesn't stop there. The hard reality is, my friends, even after we have been saved, if we're honest, we will confess that we still sin. This is John's testimony in 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This is spoken to believers in Christ, just as Hebrews is. After our conversion, we still sin. And we still need Christ's forgiveness. That's the reason for the confession of sin that we do every week in the midst of our worship service, because we need, after we've been in the presence of a holy God, to sing his praises and we see his glory, we realize our sinfulness and we need to confess. Christ changes our hearts, but the basic truth is our human nature still argues against that changed heart. And so there's that struggle within us. That's what Paul says in his testimony in Romans, 5, in Romans 7, 19. He says, for I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil that I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. We all know this struggle, if we're honest. There are sins that we continually wrestle with, and each one of us knows what our own sin is. Now, it's a little bit of public confession, all right? I will tell you, I struggle with a sarcastic tongue. I really do. Now, God is perfecting me. I've come, I've come a long way. I'm not nearly as bad, but every once in a while, that sarcastic remark will leap out, and then I, mm, I did it again, Lord, I'm sorry. That's one of my recurring sins. We all have at least one that we struggle with. It's that sin that we need to 
deal with. But that's not what the writer of Hebrews is dealing with here. We all do that. And it's confessing weekly. But there's another sin and that the writer of Hebrews is really addressing here. It's not that ongoing struggle that we acknowledge. It's the sin that we do not acknowledge that the writer of Hebrews is talking about. It is that deliberate sin, knowing that what we're doing is wrong and behaving as if we just don't care. Doing it with reckless abandon, it doesn't matter. Regardless of what God says, regardless of what the scripture said, we offer excuses for these actions, that they're just a part of who we are. Just take me the way I am. If it's sin, it's still sin. Or maybe we'll say, well, look at the culture. It accepts this. And my friends, our culture accepts many things that really are sinful. And we can excuse it. Probably one of my greatest uh, concerns, I would say, right now, is a, a vent within our culture that even Christians are falling into. And that is this idea of name calling. If there's someone that I disagree with, I give them a label. I call them a name that is a degrading, dehumanizing name. And we see it, my friends, we see it in our, in our Congress. We see it in our leadership. And it's becoming an acceptable thing. I label you. Let me tell you how very dangerous I think this one particular sin is. Let me tell you of what happened in Rwanda with that kind of labeling. It was accepted by the government in the 1980s and early 1990s. And the government labeled the Tutsi as deplorable, as less than human. In fact, they were referred to by some government officials as cockroaches and snakes. Well, you can kill a cockroach, you can kill a snake. And in 1994, that's exactly what happened. And over one million people were killed in 100 days by their neighbors because their neighbors had bought into that kind of degrading language that said they were not humans. They were less than human and they could be eliminated. Now I'm not suggesting that's where America is headed, but it's my fear of what happens with this kind of degrading language. But that's only one thing. That's one very graphic example. Think about the way we deal with adultery. They're now, it's now called extramarital affair. Nothing wrong with it. The culture accepts it. Or abortion is a choice of life. For whom? You see, our culture accepts a lot of things that scripture does not. And if we as believers say we will accept those things that the culture accepts and says yes to them when it's contrary to scripture, we're in danger of exactly what the writer of Hebrews warned about. It's a great danger because what we are doing, according to the writing of Hebrews, is if we insist upon sinning deliberately, we are stomping our feet on the cross of Christ. We are grinding Christ's offering into the ground as if it were nothing, of no value whatsoever. We're treating Christ as worthless. We're insulting the Holy Spirit. Wow. We don't think of our deliberate sins in that way, especially when they seem to be things that are accepted by our culture. We can excuse ourselves, but God does not. He holds us accountable for the things we know that are wrong. The writer of Hebrews 
says this is a dreadful thing. So what am I doing? What am I knowingly doing in my life that is displeasing to God and not condemned by the culture around me and therefore justified? What am I doing that regardless of what scripture says, I continue to do it? That's what we need to look at. Because, my friends, that is what is beyond Christ's forgiveness. Why is it beyond Christ's forgiveness? Because you say, wait a minute, wait a minute, nothing is beyond Christ's forgiveness. There is one thing that is beyond Christ's forgiveness, and that is the sin that we are unwilling to acknowledge and seek forgiveness for. Because Christ never forces his <clears throat> grace upon us. He will never insist we receive his grace. What hope is there for us? The answer is just as it was when we came to Christ. We must acknowledge our sin and turn from it. Again, back to John 1, um, verse 9. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The only thing that takes us away from God's grace is our unwillingness to receive it. And so on this Valentine's Day, Christ offers us his love, and he offers us in the form of forgiveness. Forgiveness for the things that would stand in our way and keep us from being able to persevere. God will never force us to seek his grace, but he is willing and eager to offer it to us if we honestly and sincerely confess. And so I invite you, along with myself, to examine our hearts. We're going to have an opportunity to do that in a very conscious way on Wednesday. Wednesday is Ash Wednesday, and it is a day that the church sets aside for us to seriously repent of our sins. We can do it right now, this moment, and I pray that you do if there's something that's bothering you, but there's a special service that we're going to have on Wednesday that will invite us to look deeply into those things that are sinful and to receive God's grace again and again. It's possible. There's nothing that separates us from the love of God. But we cannot receive his grace if we do not want to receive it. Do you want to be forgiven? Will you seek Christ's forgiveness? He holds out his hand, eager to welcome us. What's your response, my friends?
hands, will you join me in prayer? Oh, holy God, we bow before you, knowing that you already know our hearts, and that before a word is even out of our mouths, you know it. And yet you invite us to come, to share our minds, our hearts, our needs with you. You have invited us to partner with you. So this day, Father, we come to bring to you the concerns of our hearts, concerns for loved ones within our church family and related to our church family. For we know there are those who are facing surgery. Within the young family, there are several, and we ask for your healing mercy. There are those who are dealing with discouragement, and we ask for the presence of your spirit to comfort and encourage. There are those who are facing difficult decisions. We ask for your direction and wisdom. There are those who are faith facing difficult circumstances with family dynamics. And, oh, Father, we ask for your intervention. We ask for your peace. We have friends who are struggling as well. We think of Pastor Hamilton and his wife, who are both battling cancer, and their daughter, who's facing surgery in France. And we ask for your intervention for them. <clears throat> In our own lives, there are friends that we have, and we lift them in the quiet of our hearts to you at this time. But Father, we would be as selfish people if we only prayed for our own needs. We lift to you the needs of our community, for there are many who are without jobs and are struggling to find their way forward. We ask for your provision. We lift to you our country, because right now it's divided. It's divided socially and economically, but maybe most importantly right now, it's divided politically. And it seems beyond our control, and yet, holy God, nothing is beyond your ability. And so we lift our country to you, and we ask for your reviving spirit to bring peace and reconciliation. We think of our wider world, and we know that there are places where people are starving. We ask for your provision. We know that there are places where there is fighting, and we ask for your peace. Where there is oppression, we ask for your provision. In all of this, Father, we would ask that you would make us instruments of your grace. Help us to see where we can be instruments of love, of peace, of reconciliation, instruments of provision and care spur our hearts to reach out beyond ourselves, to serve you as we serve those around us. In all things, Lord God, we ask that you would keep us in your grace and your name would be glorified. We ask this in your powerful name, O Lord and Savior. Amen. Oh.
receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and always. Amen.